call and get going? <clears throat> well, welcome everyone here live in Zoom and watching us live on Facebook. And the hundreds of you that, that, that use the gift of us having our readings on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry due to the dedication of Don Krieger who makes sure that our recordings are spit spot and up and available on our Facebook and YouTube. For all of your viewing pleasure, if you're not able to join us live. Well, for those of you who are joining us live today, you are here for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry New Books Showcase. It's our final New Books Showcase of 2022. I cannot believe it. And we have had an exceptional array of new book showcases during this year. And we are crescendoing today with the amazing poetry of this quartet that will be bringing the poetry to you in the forms of Mega Sood, Raul Sanchez, Mary Louise Kiernan, and Meg Carney. I've been looking forward to this reading for many a time because I've been very eager to um, be able to have these particular poets and their particular books in the new book showcase for the 2022 season. And I hope that each of you will appreciate the poetry as much as, as, much as I personally appreciate their work and in particular, these books that they'll be showcasing today. Well, a reminder for all of us here in uh, all of us here in the in the in the audience that last week I want to thank everyone, all the stars that came out for our poets focus, our open mic on the theme of stars. It was an incredible, incredible constellation of poetry. I, I feel like we created a whole evening sky together um, with the poetry that you all brought. And so December has just been so, so special. And again, today adds to that as we round out our 2020 to season. I've been thinking a little bit about how, I thought a little bit about Andy Warhol this week and, and one of his famous quotations was that everybody will be famous for 15 minutes and thought about how incredible it is that we get to gather once a month and every poet who shares with us in our new book showcase has that 15 minutes of love and fame. Um, maybe not in the in the not in maybe not in the the less than beautiful, le, you know, less than um the less than The less than exceptional way that we think of fame. I mean, fame has that dark side, but I think of just the the fame of being in community. Um, so I'm taking that idea of everybody will be famous um, in a very slightly different vein, and loving that we provide a, a showcase where the richness of each person, each poet's books can shine and have its moment in the light for about 15 minutes 
uh, with the really the, the most dedicated audiences that I that that I've seen as I've been going through this miraculous journey with you that we all together call Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Well, with that, a very quick reminder to our audience members that the books for today that we'll be showcasing with our astounding poets, the links will be in the chat for you uh, to purchase if you have the resources. And as I always remind people, at this time of year, poetry is perhaps the best gift that you could offer to any of your beloveds during this holiday season. So please do indulge if you have the resources and uh, purchase some of the books for today or any of the poets that you've seen and that are on our Facebook page, uh, they, will, they will make for tremendous gifts during this season of gratitude and giving. And finally, the chat is live for you to shower the poets you love with love. Respectful comments, of course, but uh, one of the things I truly, truly enjoy uh, about Cultivating Voices live poetry, and that can be really different from other readings that I go to on Zoom, is uh, we always have such a robust chat and, and this outpouring of, of, of show, you know, showering the poets we love with love. So let's keep that going today. Uh, in our chat. And with that, let's go to our first reader for today. Well, our first reader is none other than Mary <laughs> Louise Kiernan. Again, all of our poets today have, you know, participated in cultivating voices in various ways um, over the over the, the course of, of our programming and so I feel just a sense of familiarity and gratitude having um, this particular quartet with us. But nevertheless, um, uh, when having all of that said, I always do share the more formal biography because uh, as I said, I feel such a, a warmth and familiarity with, with the folks here today. But let me share a little bit more about Mary Louise with you. Mary Louise Kiernan is a member of Calling All Poets and the Woodstock Poetry Society. She was awarded the 2015 Poetry Prize by Tempe Public Library in partnership with Arizona State University. Kiernan's poetry appears in the New York Times and elsewhere and her debut poetry collection is titled The Gift of Glossophobia. How could anyone refuse not purchasing and <laughs> giving the gift of glossophobia as a gift to someone during this holiday season? Well, here is the, the true gift of Mary Louise Kiernan for all of you today to top to start us off here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, our new book showcase. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy, so much. And um, there are <clears throat> three poets that I would like to acknowledge from the get-go here. And the first is Don Krieger, author of Discovery. Kim Ports Parsons, author of The May Apple Forest, and Sandy You Know, Quotes for Women. And I read those in alphabetical order, so I did not play favorites, but you are all my favorites. So the title of my collection is The Gift of Glossophobia. 
the word glossophobia. Glosso is the Greek word for tongue, and phobia obviously is fear. So it is the fear of speaking, it's the fear of public performance, and I take it a step further, and it's a fear of voicing my own opinion. And the photo that is on the cover is this picture that is of me. And it was taken shortly before I participated in a dance recital that went all wrong. And as a little girl, I was traumatized and never ever wanted to be on stage again. So uh, the reason I call it a gift now is because if I had not been stricken with glossophobia at such an early age, I probably would not have written down so many of these poems. So my collection is in three sections, and I'd like to read a couple of poems from each of those sections. The first is titled, first section is titled Love slash Anti-Love. And I have a quote by Seamus Heaney, walk on air against your better judgment. And this is the poem that won that prize that I'm still astounded by. It was first drafted at the Omega Institute uh, at a workshop led by the Pulitzer Prize winning poet Sharon Olds. The title is No Dwelling. My high on the hill home must be multiply listed with no time to room. I resolve myself like the persistent sparrow mourning its egg filled nest knocked from above the front door cornice. Bewildered, the bird shuddered midair, its wings backpedaling furiously in place. How fast can a bird's heart beat before bursting? Quelling my own palpitations, I will mirror the ways of the winged one that rebuilt its nest, flight after flight after flight after flight, meshing leaves and twigs with mossy mud, then weaving in a single strand of my child's hair, loosened during a porch side hair brushing. How fast can my own heart beat before soaring? The next one is uh, a prose poem and it was, um, my hands are shaking for a couple of reasons. Um, I opened a fortune cookie and I ended up writing an obad because of this. Dawn, the accomplice of love is art, folded in a paper fortune, revealing unlocked luggage, yawns images like mist on that lake inside moss woods, Below silver rivets, through jet wings, clouds, feathery quills, inked by stars, burst sunflowers, peek through shutters above the alley of rain, pearls, one cobbled roadway, drawing beyond the train cars toward terracotta warriors on guard for hearts in hidden rooms where morning loves break smooth. Scented linens sigh their finale. Obad, Obad, Obad. So I consider myself more of a page poet than a performance poet. And I work really hard on how things appear on the page. Um, just want to add that in. Uh, the next poem uh, is called Every Poet's Heart's Desire. And it's couplets. And this is my humble homage to poets who no longer breathe, yet whisper still to me the form, obviously, Emily Dickinson's. The words gladly dead come from Edna St. Vincent Millay's Renaissance. And the word wild escapes from Mary Oliver's Summer Day. Every poet's heart's desire. Every poet's heart's desire is each truth told that we aspire. Long we be so gladly dead with not one buried word unsaid. Pray not our thoughts wild remain 
save ones found in the public domain. And after I wrote that, uh, there was uh, an online uh, literary magazine called Enclave. And they were looking for poems that um, if you had one last thing to say on this earth, what would it be? So I ended up submitting it and I'm very grateful that they published it. So the second section is titled Riptide. And I started with a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. Title of this poem is My American Stork Quilt. And it begins with a, po um, a quote by Lucille Clifton. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellow eyed woman sits with her daughter quilting. My star quilt outstretched across my car's hood, another yard sale, another letting go, another home to pack up, releasing once again, when a young mother with two little ones claims her church is collecting blankets for victims of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'd hand sewn bias tape to make loops to hang it, too perfect, too precious to use as a blanket. I think back to the summer day I first held it, a hundred dollars saved to buy post baby clothes. Instead, I turned back to the upscale shop in Bridgehampton, east of the Indian reservation. Stitched by Native American tribeswoman, a platinum saleswoman took pride in telling wrapping it in layers of aqua tissue paper as if it might break. Yes, please take it, I say to the young mother, a yellow eyed woman teaching me my quilt was never mine to keep. And that was actually published in Inscape. And this is a detail from a quilt. So that worked out nicely. Um, this poem, uh, began as a short story. I went back to school and got my degree from Empire State College. And then I reread it and decided I would make it into a poem. My father died October 19th, 1987. And this is a story, a true story. Personal effects, 1987. Tears are heart vapors that rise to the head and escape. 17th century folklore. I will see one man die twice. A black man who used blue as I spoon feed my sheet white father, yellow mash in his VA hospital room. The first time the gentleman dies, he is sitting up. Legs hung over the rumpled linens. He tugs at the tube taped to his nostril. A figure glides past the doorway asks the peppery haired fellow how he's doing and he gurgles, oh, okay. Uplifted in greeting, his arm ratchets, he keels backward. He's not breathing, I gasp to the desk nurse who sighs, clicks her ballpoint pen, closed, trudges in, but bolts out shouting a code that's blue too. The next Sunday, I smooth withered stroke clenched hand of my blind unblinking father. Convinced he knows nothing of the blue balloon of a man who seems mummified and taut, creaseless sheets stamped with the Castle Point imprint, when an electronic screech summons a team of starch white uniforms. In slow code mode, personnel defibrillate, disconnect, detach. Who's got the personal effects bag? I spoon feed my father green mash until he seals his lips squeezes his eyelids shut, one tear escapes, and I know he knows. The last section is titled Glossophobia, and Maggie Kuhn, who started um, the Grey Panthers because she was forced to retire at 65 and wasn't having it. Um, this is a quote from Maggie. Speak your mind even if your voice shakes. So I was baptized Catholic, 12 years of Catholic school. 
no longer participate, but I would say that I'm still culturally Catholic. You can't, you can take the girl out of the church, but not necessarily the church out of the girl. And this basically has to do with my fury regarding Joseph Ratzinger, who was Benedict XVI, who was removed as Pope because his brother has been accused of molesting hundreds of choir boys in Germany. So there are a few words, the Bishop of Rome is what Pope Francis wants to be called. He feels that's more humble than being called the Pope. The word see, S-E-E, -E, is another name for the Vatican. And the censors that I mentioned are the metal chain vessels that the incense comes from. And I didn't intend this to be a rhyming tercet, but that's what it turned out to be. A show of mercy, a lament. As the news breaks, the Bishop of Rome declares 2016 to be the year of mercy. With consecrated virgins at his call, Benedict XVI conveniently uninstalled, then retired behind Vatican convent walls. He has lost his spiritual strength, they say, as one means to keep him out of the way. His sole function as Pope Emeritus is to pray. While in hiding, Areste Domiciliari conceals the past perfect padre, who piously kneels, harbored in perpetual exile that shields. His papal fisherman's ring torched by fire, wearing white since on ice does he conspire with his sure held to freeze afore he expires. Cloistered and contained as keeper of the gall, he secretes that brothers tall hurt brothers small, the cruelest twist on brotherly love for all. Bending the sea's obedient followers turn deaf ears to claims of his brother's choir cruelty for years. For when the smoke from censors disappears, let him pray. I'm very angry. <laughs> So we uh, did some readings a little while ago um, about the mass shootings that never seem to be ending. And the title of this poem is Tritaka, which is actually a yoga position. It's a gazing meditation where you focus on your third eye. But it also, to me, sounds like gunfire, Tritaka, Tritaka. Um, and in the center, I have um, a section that's all capitals. And I had worked at a radio station, and when a broadcaster is reading something, it's in all capitals. So that's something you wouldn't know from my reading it aloud. Tritaka, a great, a gazing meditation. The moon is not always what it is cracked up to be. One fractured crescent fingernail tip sheared at its nail bed. I'll sit tonight, wallow in my misery, and ready the pity party for those dramas and tragedies conjured in my head. I interrupt this rumination for a bulletin breaking with loops of audio of more rapid gunfire bursting from mass murder muzzles in our untied states, and now back to the painfully hollow poem in progress. The red moon wanes, exit wounds bleed out, entrance wounds gape, organs spill out, chests suck air, my third eye implodes. Oh, I'll sit tonight, cancel my pity party, and suffer the misery of the shame and endless grief that riddles my head. So my last poem, is uh, the final poem in my book. And it is titled The Translation. And it was written during the Sunken Garden Festival in 2016. I signed up for a workshop with Juan Felipe Herrera, who was our 21st Poet Laureate of the United States. Um, it was just 
an astounding experience. He had us moving around the room. He had us drawing on paper. Um, this is one of the sections of what he had us. And he said, no words are allowed. You just scribble, you make sounds, you just, you know. And then he said, write a poem about your drawing. So this is uh, one of the things he said during the workshop. You are going to pierce infinity. And this poem is intentionally uh, flush right instead of flush left. And it's my way of saying, I'm just struggling. I'm coming up against this wall. The translation. The translation of my drawing requires words to mark markings on bone, leather, cockle, parchment. Writing tight on folded paper recalls wherever script on feathery airmail letters. I have no language to explain the inexplicable. Concentrate, translate, relay, calculate, collate, contemplate, manipulate, devastate, mutilate. Our poor teacher schools, question marks are loud. Sounds on the page, tapping of instruments, racket on wood, minds penning, but who will unfold the parchment to hear me? Thank you. Well, everyone, as you can see, and as you've just heard, I I tried to warn you know I tried to give you the warning about like hey you're in for you're in for a reading you're in for a reading Mary Louise Kiernan kicked us off beautifully eloquently poetically lyrically and also what I really really oh really appreciated today too was how many other voices you invoked into the reading? How many other people? I mean, Edna St. Vincent Millet, <laughs> Lucille Clifton. I mean, how, you know, how your poetry is infused by the legacy of poetry. Yes. You know, and uh, I mean, what, honestly, what a gift for, for, for all of us that continue, you know, on this journey with this craft. I feel like it was a lesson in poetry itself. And also the visuals. That's amazing, you know, the from the sunken garden, that's what an incredible, what an incredible, what an incredible, incredible, what an incredible poem to have emerged from what I'm sure when it initially was there on the page, you're like, what the heck, right? And then may, may I add that that is one of two poems that were chosen to be translated into Italian, to my oh. astonishment. It's, it's, it's often the ones Where's that the are unexpected to us. It was included in this anthology from the University of Salerno. Mm. Beautiful. It's astonishing. Thank well, you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. That is Mary Louise Kiernan, the book, along with the poet, is the gift of glossophobia. You've heard it here today. It's our new book showcase, our final new book showcase for 2022. With no fear, we're heading into 2023 and bringing back the new book showcases, but I want to mark, I want to mark this, this transition, this transition into the new year. And as I, as I, as I like to think about it as this, we've been kind of crescendoing month after month after month. Well, again, talk about crescendo. Our next poet is Mega Sud and Mega Every time I see my go read, I, I am just 
left with, I am just left with the absolute power of poetry to move me. Like it is incredible. And so again, I, I hope you've all seen Mega, that this is not your first time seeing Mega read, but if it is, get ready to be lifted out of your chair. Get ready to be lifted out of your chair. Don't worry, Meg. I know you can live up to this introduction. <laughs> I, I wouldn't set you up. I wouldn't set you up. <laughs> Megasud. Megasud is an award-winning Asian American poetry editor. And what I also so appreciate about you is how you always describe yourself as literary activist from the wonderful state of New Jersey. She's a literary partner with Life in Quarantine at Stanford University. And her new collection is My Body Lives Like a Threat from Flower Song Press 2022. She's an active blogger and tweeter and go to her bio follow her because after hearing mega's work today there's nothing else that you will want to do but to follow her and her work uh again i'm grateful for your voice and your presence today but really honestly every day thank you so much mega Thank you so much, Sandy, for this kind and generous introduction. And it's a great honor to share this space with my fellow readers today. And I have a lot to learn from each of them. And uh, uh, I'm going to be reading nine or 10 poems from my collection, uh, My Body Lives Like a Threat. And it was released this year by Flower Song Press. And uh, Raul Sanchez is one of my press fellow mates. And uh, I'm going to just, uh, my collection basically is based on the theme of body politics and the issues surrounding the body politics. And this collection is divided into five sections. And each of the sections deals with a the specific theme, but the central theme or the, the, the unified theme, which keeps runs like a th thread through all the book is how the issues of body politics and body identity, it never remains at an individual level but it like molds and morphs into this uh, monster birthing all these problems, like how the body of a woman is seen as a threat, the body of a person of color, the body of a refugee, the body of a migrant is seen as a threat. So I'm gonna be reading a few poems from each of the collection just to give you an idea. And uh, thank you everyone to be here. Just for being here means as the support for our fellow and creatives. And I'm gonna be starting my first poem from the section Black Truth, and it deals with the suppression of people of color and African-American community in and around the world. And the first poem is called Peace, a metaphor for denial. And it was the national level winner of 2020 Poetry Matters Projects, which is a 23 year old organization based in uh, Augusta, Georgia. Peace, a metaphor for denial. Peace, an act of ignorance. An act of denial is not bliss, no more. When silence is gutted like a fish and the blood of your own fills the street, how long can you be the puppet in your own peaceful country? This act of abandonment speaks a muted language for all the hearts trapped like sparrows on the other side of town. The wall creates the boundary between me and humanity. They are still considered illegal when with one foot in my land, another bloodied and stuck in the barbed wire that I put around God's own country. I was born with the privilege to call the peace of earth my own. No matter it is laced and seeped with someone else's blood, it belongs to me now. The young boy is shot, 
The pavement is stained by the color of his blood, dark and useless to the people of this peaceful country. Those who pull out the armrest and the beach chairs to see the stars light up the sky and the deafening noise, muting the wails of a widowed mother. They sip the beer as cold as their souls, leaving the scene with a shrug and a short sigh. Ignorance is bliss. Peace is a metaphor for denial. In this country, I call mine. And the next is called, Does Hurt Have a Gender? And this quote, the poem itself with its title, it poses a question for all the listeners and readers. Does hurt have a gender? What does the body want when it breaks down into a million pieces? Its pulverized existence wanting acceptance, only to be ignored and walked over, left over, like day-old milk on the kitchen counter, forgotten and left to curdle. Why do we keep numbing the sharp pain, the knotted lamentation caught in our hungry mouths? that cuts our soul both ways and leaves us to bleed in this world, profused with sweat and blood, a moment indescribable. Leaking and soaking the ridges of the curbside, hair, the thickness of your blood, its viscosity and the gravitas of your speech depends on the color of your skin, a pain untenable. An insurmountable pain rising in my mouth and dichotomy between pain and acceptance, a desire, abominable. Do screams have a religion too? Do cries have a race? Does hurt have a gender? Do wounds have a nationality? Does your tongue curl into sin when you call out my name? Does the triteness of your ideologies still mollify your pain? The next one is called demarcation. And it's based on the reflection of the broken prison system of the United States of America. Demarcation. That frail evening marking the shadows of the long summer day. A bird perched on the barbed wires of the prison, demarcating happiness and the grief, acceptance and rejection. Solitude and the bouts of laughter, the prisoner and the free. The arresting height of that boisterous wall whose bricks are soaked with the crackling wails and sobs of the broken souls neatly carved and plastered. A bizarre tinge of the ochre peeling off from the walls as the tears flow incessantly through blurry eyes as they gaze from emptiness to nothing. Silence sculled in hollow bones, rattling with rage. Palms holding out for someone, something, for forgiveness. A fleeting touch of humanity, a soft, supple touch of love. A day wrapped around the promises of second chances. Silhouette of the loved ones appearing between the thick bars. A pleasant sight for the cracked and pale eyes. Death and silence are interchangeable. Go ask the bird as it sits at the barbed fire ends, keeping the two realms separate, a socially justifiable demarcation between the cacophony and the melody, the symmetry and the dissonance between the pristine and the ostracized. How thin is the separation between love and acceptance, despair and second chances, between judged and the forgiven? And the next is called, it's based on the snapshot of a wanton house and the atrocities of the war which happens on the common people who have nothing but to gain nothing from a war, which feeds the power hungry and the rich. Tourniquet, snapshot of a wanton house. A patch of green growing in the living room of a wanton house. Leaves growing out of the cracks the door unhinged now lying asunder, ceiling 
shredded into a thousand elegies to the blue sky, a lone witness to the massacred sh shreds torn thin as the promise of life, muted and dumbfounded. Sometime it needs more than a lone promise of God in a home to heal. Sharpened with deafening silence, sorrow morphs and molds in its own ways. Death has its own language, a razor sharp vernacular, a wailing widow in the street, a half broken frame of the window once laced with laughter seeping into the cracked tiles of this house with sepia tinged walls, memories peeling off like a broken promise left on the kitchen shelf to curl. A tiny green patch growing through this broken house, healing with every sapling, every tiny leaf growing through the cracks, breaking through the pain. The next is called False Ownership. And this was the poem I wrote uh, when there was the violation of the reproductive rights of the women in the United States. And it's it's a very unsafe place for the women as we have to continuously write for our freedom to reproduction and right to our own body and right to our own choices in life. It's called False Ownership. This is strangely annoying. When you see arrogance in someone who doesn't own a thing, can't conjure a thing out of thin air, let alone a human being. You are just the renter here. You don't own shit. You are born from this womb that cradles your existence for months, a sliver away from called being. Nothing but a pulsating existence in a foreign body. Sometimes the body treats it like an infection to keep away the contamination, self-purging an act of reclamation. Sometimes it accepts, cups its own palm, supports you, carries it to term. It's the body, the arrangement, the unsaid understanding, a solemn promise between the body and its identity. Your existence is slowly molded like a ball of sagging clay on the pot of wheel, morphed and molded to be called a human being. You don't own the womb. You definitely don't own our bodies. You break the arrangement, just like to possess the things. Let me clear this for the sake of your understanding. The body is not for your taking. There's a thin line between the choices we make and you're wanting. And the next is called mouth. And it's an ode to our mouth, an epitome and anything it catches, mouth. Our mouth is an entry point. It speaks of hunger speaks of lust, the urgency of something more sacred than the hymn's under muted breath. It speaks of the violence bodies endure, a gaping wound for our broken soul, an unspoken lexicon of silence, but misheard and misunderstood. Desires birth within it. Anything that catches our attention needs to be validated by our mouths. The epicenter of gluttony, the protagonist of the original sin. The desirous taste should sit well before we can call it our own. We call a lot of things our own. We desire, we possess the most untamed of all senses. A shiny trinket catches our attention and the slurping desire starts building. We are the creatures of the mouth. We are the creatures of the wanting. And the next is a short poem, which is called Resistance. And it's an ode to all the people who's writing for the unspoken and the unheard and how is our craft is basically a medium which helps us to be a become a voice who do, who those for those who cannot speak. Resistance. 
I don't wait for you to corroborate my truth, evidence to prove the finality of my desires. I don't wait for your soft touches to smooth my scars, a tourniquet to stop this bleeding. I don't want you to comfort me in the middle of the night only to unravel my pain in the morning. As my body goes from a shade darker than yesterday, I don't need the assurance of the revolution around the corner. I birth my own revolution and I create my own marches. The truth my soul owes to nobody but me. A conversation with my higher self, a divine evolution. When I resist, I create. The next is called, thank you everyone. The next is called, My Body is Not an Apology. And it's my title poem from my chapbook, which was published in 2021 by Finishing Line Press. And it's also a part of my this book, my full length collection. And uh, it, it has been part of a lot of anthologies and it has also received special commendation from Kaveh Akbar in the New York City Poetry Festival. So that's something I really cherish. Uh, my body is not an apology. This body, my body, is not an apology. It's a prayer. Forgiveness wrapped in the filigrees end of my skin, frayed at the ends, battered for so long by your pointy convictions and the cookie cutter rules that try to shape and mold this body along. My body is not an apology. It doesn't desire to fit in a frame mapped inch by inch else to be ashamed. My body is not an apology. It's a role, a declaration, an unapologetic, unabashed, straight in your face truth, a war cry, a deafening scream from the silence. My body is not an apology. This body will not be mapped as a benchmark for beauty, an attempt to hide crow's feet or the spider veins from your wild eyes and your forked tongue. My body is not an apology, but a safe haven, an epitome of affection, a metaphor for crimson love that flows in my veins for years to come. My body is not an apology, it's an eye of the storm, a dance of destruction, a safe haven for life, forgiveness in disguise. With love, neatly folded in the wrinkles of my skin, warmth oozing from every core of my being, a lesson etched in every single crow's feet, forgiveness written through every inch of me. This body is not an apology. It is a profound lesson a triumphant proclamation, an unfettered declaration. The next poem is called My Survival Story and it was one of the winners of the NAMI NJ Poetry Contest in 2020. It was the state level winner. And uh, NAMI is a grassroots national organization for National Alliance of Mental Illness and I've been a part of it for quite some years. Uh, it's called My Survival Story. The slow cleaving in my backbone, a seamless transformation, branching into my thousand selves like a sapling breaking from the blind seed. I'm sprouting, I'm thriving. Growing like a medusa, this fecundity of myself, breaking out into thousand versions of me, morphing into shapes, perfecting, the art of topiary, like a reflection of the summer sun shining into a million versions of me on shards of broken mirror, blessing them with its supricity. I am the war cry, the mortal fear, residing behind enemy lines, the lava, the primordial gel, creating life so sublime. I am the knowledge in the verse and the smattering cacophony of your mind. With inked breaths and walnut skin, boisterous, unfettered, and uncontrolled, walking barefoot on this graveled path and spooling life's fear in its intimate corridors, 
My pain, my pain impaled on the stars in the nightly sky. I shine through my pulverized skin. The broken pieces I foraged together to make a whole of me, an untrammeled beauty within. This fecundity is my survival instinct to handle the plethora of emotions life throws at me, undulating between the proximity and prosody of pain. I am learning. Yes, I am growing. And the second last poem is called We All Rise Out of Love. And it shows the love for the food and for our culture that we carry ourselves inside us with our hyphenated identities as the first generation immigrant. And how the food all around the earth and the love for our tradition bounds us and brings us together. We all rise out of love. My tongue twists and turns, trying to fit the cookie cutter in a land unknown. The words put in my mouth, like the small portions, those calls, made by warm, supple hands of my mother, as I gently wait for the next one. Her fingers always doused by the fragrance of bay leaves, turmeric tainted, the various shades, as she kneads the atta and dispenses life lessons in the kitchen on a warm summer day. She taught me kindness comes from the heart, but hunger pierces a man the most. So learn to soothe hunger, the lingering pain, as she puts all her strength into kneading the atta into the dollop of the milky moon. My language is different than yours. I try fervently to explain to my son who keeps correcting my pronunciation as I teach him the basics of love, kindness, and purity of heart. Sometimes I wonder how this world, marred and demarcated by the boundaries, those twisted pronunciations would look beautifully kneaded together, like the lump of moon sitting in the copper-clad vessel of my mother, waiting to rise out of warmth. And I'm gonna close this reading by the title poem of my collection, My Body Lives Like a Threat. My body lives like a threat. A wound opens its mouth and becomes self-inflicting, just like the night in its extreme, vulnerable to a ray of light. Its existence challenged and yet it stands bravely unfettered by the challenges of the dawn. As I catch the words in my mouth, my language becomes an open threat. My razor speech falling sharp on your dull convictions. We always expose our deepest and softest parts to heal. That's how the body learns to heal, to grow. To be vulnerable is an elegy for acceptance. We have hunger written all over us with the ink as black as the mole on your shoulder, challenging the frothiness of the moonlight. My unspoken words sit like a welt on my tongue in this foreign world. Every time I twist my tongue to shape a word, I mispronounce your fear. A new threat is born. Thanks everyone for listening. You know, sometimes because I'm in the Zoom screen, you know, I want to give a standing ovation, <laughs> but then, you know, you just see my sweater, but that's what your poetry, that's really what your poetry brings out, brings out in me, my guy. It's like um, your line, I create my own marches. I just want to, I just want to stand up and march with you in voice and power, you know, and solidarity when I am hearing your work. And the title of the book is My Body Lives Like a Threat. And I also say, and your voice lives like an anthem. No, thank you. Absolute so. anthem. 
folks, you know, I, I take notes and I've got notes all over my pages here. There's so many things. Uh, it's true of like everybody and I can't get to everything I'd like to say. So I humbly, humbly encourage you all to stand to the mega and create your own, you know, create, create your own marches with poetry. I mean, this is what Cultivating Voices is all about. And I thank you for being today and always the shining example of it, the shining, shining example of it through your work and your literary activism. Again, the book is My Body Lives Like a Threat from Flower Song Press. And I'm so glad that you mentioned um, My Body is Not an Apology, the chapbook, because that's where I first discovered your work actually, was, was um, finding the chapbook on Finishing Line Press and ordering it. And so again, thank you for, thank you for bringing the constellation of consciousness to Cultivating okay. Voices today. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you. And we'll see you again soon, I hope. Thank well, you so folks, much. our, um, you know, we, we often have a quartet and, and, and as Mega had mentioned, Raul Sanchez, a, 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 one, a, a dear friend of mine, lo well, local, because we're, we live in Washington State, is also scheduled to be with us today, also from Flower Song Press. You've heard Raul. And we'll have to bring Raul back for the reading, um, which means that today we've had the three M's. Mary Louise. Mega and Meg Carney. Meg Carney, this is what I want to say about Meg's work. When I when I was introduced to your poetry and then got to hear you read for the first time. I was like, this is why poetry exists. Like this, this is it. This is why it exists. So like, this is why I come to hear it, to read it, to experience it. I mean, we've gotten, and what I also love, what I love about Cultivating Voices is the variety of what we get to experience. But I, I'm truly mesmerized when I get to hear Meg Carney's poetry. Um, there is an, ex an exquisiteness, a precision, a power to it that if, again, I mean, Meg's been with us before. If you haven't heard Meg read before, um, you know, this is like having like the three tenors on today. I feel like, wow. So, <laughs> Thank you, Meg, for being with us today. And let me share with you a little more um, about Meg. Meg Carney's most recent book, All Morning the Crows, won the 2020 Washington Prize and made the Small Press Distribution Poetry bestseller list April through September of 2021 it, and was nominated for a Pushcart Prize and was awarded the Silver Medal in Forward Reviews Indies Book Award for Poetry. Again, um, you'll hear the poetry today and you'll understand why this is an award-winning collection. Um, and actually we've had award winners all throughout today. And you can clearly see why these, these three poets are receiving the accolades just for their exceptional poetry. Meg, in addition 
to being that consummate poet and voice shares that gift by directing the Solstice MFA program at LaSalle University in Massachusetts. It is always a pleasure to have you, Meg, on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much to Sandy and, and Kim and Don um, for creating this community that I've been coming to since its start pretty much. Uh, so I did read in the open mic once, but it's really um, an honor to be part of this uh, new books showcase and to read with Mary Louise and Mega. Oh my goodness, both of you rock. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna read from All Morning the Crows, uh, the WordWorks Press, can't say enough good things about the WordWorks. And I will um, open with the, the first poem in the book, which is Owl. So each, each poem in the book is a different bird. And uh, these were all um, kind of inspired in part by a book uh, called 100 Birds and How They Got Their Names. So Owl will kind of set you up for, for the second poem that I'll read, which is a longer poem. So Owl. She birthed you, but she is so unknowable. Is that the word? Try nocturnal. Each night she glides on wings silent as a vole quivering under snow. Perched on your bedroom sill, she watches you dream twitch, then spins her head to spy the snow mound ripple, sugary in moonlight as the vole tunnels past pines. She lifts off and silent still And you, daughter of hurt and squeal, are awake. When you sigh, your heart-shaped face aches. Is that the word? Try breaks. Knowing when she dies, you'll inherit all she's swallowed whole yet had to leave behind. So thanks. Um, we just passed the anniversary of the date when my first mother um, gave me up for adoption at age five months. And I was brought to my adoptive home about three weeks later. Um, so it was so close to Christmas that her one gift to me besides my life, was uh, a stuffed Santa that she put in my crib that my mom gave me many, many, many years later. Um, so this is Crow. It takes about eight and a half minutes to read. Um, so thanks in advance for your patience. It, it comes in 24 short sections, so I'll just uh, pause between each section. Crow. It was a crow first taught me how to pry a thing open, snatch a stick to leverage a headstone, or widen the hole in a rotten pine's trunk to get at the story inside. New York. 1999. If our mother had kept you, my newly found sister said, you'd never have gone to college. Wouldn't have done a lot of things you've done. Ornithologists claim crows have an innate sense of fairness. 
One will scoff at your proffered raisin, for example, if you've given her sister two peanuts. If you've given her sister away, that's a fact best kept cached, like the crow's scraps of roadkill and white oak acorns. I wasn't the first apprentice to the crow, first to learn that old term crowbar, handy for getting at grubs and slugs or warding off a man with a brick for a fist. Flip the bar around to hook a beetle, but not a mother, not a sister. If she had kept me? A rooster crows, crows caw. Explain that, and while you're at it, at it, how you came to laugh, my mother's laugh, my newly found sister said. I said, I never claimed to be anyone's interpreter. She said, our I meant to say, our mother. Rhode Island, 1960. Hear that? Crows are songbirds too, squawk the nuns in their choir loft. See the one with the little silver cross in her beak, jimmying the blue gold window's latch? That's her, my first mother. Our mother told me, my newly found sister said, she went to Catholic boarding school. I said, well, the convent. Our mother did not speak a secret language. She spoke the language of secrets. As any ex-nun would tell you, the world isn't simply black and white. Consider a plum in a crow's beak in sunlight. Consider the nun's habit sunk to its knees in the confessional's dark. Color of a broken vow, iridescent as a cancer cell. Apprentice, yes, I told my newly found sister. Ravens? You have to work your way up to ravens. Corpses, cemeteries, what many people think when they hear crow, also known as the pallbearer of souls. By the time I found my first mother, she had been dead 17 years. Why was I surprised? At her grave, I left a silver earring for the crows to find. Does anyone ever see a scarecrow and think crow? Cornfields maybe, or father, is that you? If you leave us, the nuns in Bristol told my first mother, you will die a terrible death. But she stole a dress blue as a baby crow's eye, plus 500 nickels, bought a bus ticket to Boston. The dress, a newly arrived novitiate's. Crow's eye blue, code for so sexy, it was in the to be burned bin. How did she go from Boston to New York to Tucson? Why didn't she tell us about you, my newly found sister wants to know. She now thinks I have the knowledge of crows. From the crow's nest of her getaway ship, my first mother could have seen nothing useful 
not the snake charmer with his charming snake or Prince Charming, or how a daughter can shrink to a name on a dotted line, to one wide brown eye on the horizon before falling off the edge of her world. In Scotland, crows are corbies, Granddad never lost his brogue, my newly found sister said. She said she could still hear him singing about the twa corbies who feast on a dead knight's bonny blue eyes. When still in her sister Gabriella disguise, my first mother taught second grade. All those children none of them hers. Snack time milk box cost five cents. Add it up. Fact, crows can recognize human faces, even remember them years later. The first time I saw my mother in a photograph, I thought it was some sort of trick mirror. Hello, I said, I know you. You are she when I last remember her well, my newly found sister said. No place for a ship in Arizona, meaning no daily departures leaving from Boston or New York where I was harbored. Was that the allure, to be far from the Atlantic, its relentless chant, though the desert is its own type of sea? She was given a photograph of me to keep. Grief came in waves like the heat. On overcast days, before clocks, Jews began the Sabbath when crows came home to roost. Crows don't need a timepiece. Sunsets when all the good stuff starts to happen. Arizona, 1983. This is the story I've been told with a few guesses thrown in. Round and round my first mother's deathbed flew the sisters of Bristol, that murder of crows. I have another daughter, she whispered to her husband, low so her children wouldn't hear. He promised to find me, thinking this would make her live. Told you so, chanted the crows, settling like a wreath at her feet. How did she get to Tucson? Some say the Southern route, a brand new Corvair convertible. I say she flew. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll read a, a poem for my, my parents, my mom and dad. I lost my dad um, in 1990 and mom 20 years later uh, in 2010. This is Pheasant. This pheasant won't be shot by fat men after breakfast. This pheasant's etched in stone. There I go again, dreaming of home, my father's love of pheasants, my father long gone. The stone is granite and marks my father's grave. All morning, the crows have behaved badly, 
while the pheasant, wings stretched wide, waits for a flight that never begins. He's been ready just 20 years, yet his rock is showing wear so much for immortality. Who will save you now, mock the crows, pulling plastic tulips from the ground. Not the pheasant, bound by stone into silence. Not his brother crow, that clown, who has staked a claim to the fresh earth mound where my mother lies, so newly arrived, she's still saying her hellos. Okay, just two more. So we're coming up um, not only on, on uh, Hanukkah and Christmas, but St. Stephen's Day, which is December 26th. Um, so I'm going to read Wren um, in honor of St. Stephen, who um, he was stoned to death. And uh, it was said that a wren was... Um, the bird that gave him away where he was hiding to his enemies. And so it became this tradition in Celtic cultures to go around on St. Stephen's Day, December 26. Um, these mummers or actors, mimes, um, would go house to house with at first a, a dead wren, a real dead wren. And, and these days um, they use a stuffed wren or a fake wren. Um, so wren. It's a winter wren, mouse-like and secretive, that's made a home in the pocket of my old canvas coat. Hanging on a nail inside the tool shed, that coat's kept a couple of generations dry. Why not another? Besides, the bird's nest solves a mystery. I thought I'd heard a song sparrow, that hard two-syllable kim kim call, but I couldn't place those high tinkling warbles tucked deep in the ferns and thick underbrush beyond the weeping willow. Once I thought I heard God calling from there, but that turned out to be an uncommon bird too, at least it didn't appear in any guide. One book says it's not uncommon to find a house wren nesting in your coat pocket. A winter wren is favored by mummers, those straw boys of dingle playing penny whistles through their motley masks begging a tuppence to bury the bird on St. Stephen's Day. Why did the Irish martyr a wren to honor St. Stephen? You'll have to ask them. William Blake warned against it, but they aren't about to let some Englishman mar a custom, even if he was a great poet. Which brings me back to this wren in my pocket. Its name might come from the Swedish, Vrinsk, uncastrated, or the Anglo-Saxon, Wren, lascivious. Prostitutes were once called wrens. Another reason why I'll leave this nest alone, not feeling righteous enough to cast the first stone. Thanks. And I will end with the last poem in the book, which is Sparrow, um, in which I'll point out another Anglo-Saxon word. And thank you again, um, Sandy and Kim and Don and Mary Louise and, and Mega and all of you for being here. Really appreciate it. So Sparrow, um, there's a an epigraph from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, the house sparrow takes frequent baths. 
dust, dust bats, sorry. It throws soil and dust over its body feathers, just as if it were bathing with water. Sparrow. Saint Bede said the soul is a sparrow. It flits in one door, flutters down a hall, disappears out another door, a brownish black, soon forgotten flash. Sparrow. The word itself from the Anglo-Saxon means a flutterer. To flutter is to float. Sparrow on waves, sparrow on a pond. Or flutter is to contract, to beat irregularly. Sparrow in my heart. Or to tremble with excitement. I could barely contain my sparrow. If water flutters, there's more than a ripple. This morning, a sparrow splashes in the garden dirt like a baby in the tub. A soul, perhaps, celebrating its former body returned as promised to dust. Oh, my very being wants to believe, but my faith, that sparrow, flutters. So when my grave's been dug, when they lower my dust into the ground, may a host of sparrows bathe with me. May we fling that fresh earth upward, then lift our faces as it rains back down. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Uh, I had the joy, the, I don't know if joy is the right word. I had the experience because it's, it's, there's, it's something different than joy, but I have the experience of hearing Meg read at the beginning of the year. And now at the end of the year, and I'm like, this is the perfect bookend. This, these are the perfect bookends. And I'm like, can I somehow manufacture that every single year of the rest of my life to like start out my year hearing you read and oh. end my year hearing you read? Thank you so much. Um, you know, there are... There are a few poets that I would dare to say could deliver on the promise of doing this, which is a, really a, practically a quote from from your from All Morning the from 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 Crow. Um, breaking open the language of secrets, as well as the secrets of language. I mean, that is, I think, the definition of your poetry. I was thinking also of the word aviary, right? We're all, we're, we're birds, where birds live together, which another word for aviary, another definition of aviary is actually flight cages. Mm -hmm. And the juxtaposition of being caged and being in flight. I mean, that tension between them. And I feel like that's like your, the book and the reading was its own aviary. Like every line was a flight cage, like an incredible, incredible flight cage. Everybody. Meg Carney, thank you, uh, thank you. I you know I can't say anything. I mean, I could say plenty more, but I will stop. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, the book is all morning. 
the crows. I, I happen to know that Meg did more research than you could have possibly imagined that you would ever do and learn about birds to create this book. And I feel the better for this book being in the world. Oh my gosh. And folks, today here on our new book showcase, I told, I, I tried to warn you all at the beginning. I, I really did. I tried to warn you that this combination of poets today would absolutely astound you. And today we heard from the poetry, Mary Louise Kiernan, Mega Sud, and Meg Carney. Let's take a moment to unmute and in our full song, share our appreciation of the work that we heard today. Congratulations. Oh, Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quite, quite the reading. I thank uh -huh. all of I thank all of you uh -huh. for being here. Those of you that were here live, even in these little squares. Well soon, Mary Louise. Our own flight cages, right? That we get to be in. We get we get to soar by hearing the poetry while we're like in these little squares, had quite the experience. I hope those of you now that may be watching this in recording are, are, are ha I can't imagine you having a less equally astounding experience. So thank you all for being with us today, whether you're in person here live in Zoom, watching on Facebook and or watching the recordings as hundreds of you do daily. Again, another encouragement for you. If you were moved by this poetry today, and I, I don't know how one could not have been, please buy the collection of collections today. You can have the beautiful collection of our three poets today. Um, all the links will be posted on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry on Facebook tomorrow, Monday, as they are every, every, um, every new book showcase, thanks to Kim Ports Parsons. And uh, next week, my friends, we will gather It's our holiday poetry open house, or as I like to say, it's our ho, ho, oh reading, ho, po, oh reading, our holiday poetry open house. I hope you'll take a little bit of time out of your Sunday, next Sunday, to come gather, either listen to a poem, read a poem in celebration of our entire year of poetry here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Always at the top of the hour for me here in Olympia, Washington, that's 12 noon, you check your time zones. Uh, there'll be people from all over the globe joining us and I hope that you will be one of them. And I hope you'll come live, it'll be There'll be some wonderful surprises as well. How could it be a holiday gathering, an open house without a few lovely surprises? So do join us next week. It's our last gathering of 2023. We're so grateful for the opportunity to be able to share that with all of you. Well, as I always say at the end of the programs here, I uh, encourage you all to take very good care of yourselves, take extremely good care of your beloveds. And as we have from the example of our poets today, look at what happens when we keep writing, keep writing, 
your astounding poetry because I and so many others look forward to hearing it at a future Cultivating Voices live poetry. Well, that's it for me today. I'm Sandy Yuno, and your host for Cultivating Voices live poetry with the deepest of appreciation, of course, to Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons, the true stars of Cultivating Voices live poetry. I hope until next week, my friend, but whenever, I'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, oh, everyone. Hello, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.